who it was a draw at Old Trafford and Klopp still hasn't beat Eric Ten Hag at the Theatre of Dreams. But should we have won that game? Was it a fair result? We are here to break it all down with Faz, Jordan and Ricky. I mean, first things foremost, Ricky, do you take a point coming out? Or are you coming out really disappointed in the way that we kind of conceded that equaliser? No, I'm over the moon. Absolutely over the moon. I'd have bit your hand off before the game, and I don't get too reactionary over what happens in games. Uh, you know, late on, as you know, when I say it's not really a little thing, it's an important thing, but it's still one moment in the game that that cost us two points. But it's it's difficult. I can't I can't turn the clock back and say you know we we could win this game. I'm over the moon with a point, and I'd have bit your hand off for a point before the game. And how how that ended up being a draw doesn't really matter to me. I'm over the moon with a draw. Jordan, how are you feeling about it? Uh, I, again, similar to Ricky, I think pre-game, uh, I would have done anything to nick a point uh, today because going into it, I wasn't confident. Predicted that we'd walk away with, with a loss. But for me, as the game played out, I'd just like us to just be a bit more clever and not so hot-headed and be able to close out games. If you look at the last three games, we've been in winning positions and haven't been able to, you know, to, to get across the line. Uh, it's the difference between getting two points out of nine. Um, so I am slightly disappointed, but you know we've got to remember where we've come from. Um, it was a good point. Yes, and welcome to everybody who will be joining over from Mark's final score. Faz, first half compared to second half, I thought there were two. There were, there were, there were similar, but there were two. There were two different halves in my opinion in terms of. First half, we could have gone in like three or four nil down. Second half, yes, Liverpool still did have chances, but I actually feel like they were they were rocking at one point and we could have put them away. How did you see it? Um, you say we could have gone three four in the first half, but I think I, if if Salah had a shooting boot on, we could have gone three four no, in said, the second I, half. No, as I said, well. I said they, they oh they could have gotten. Yeah, yeah they could have gotten. Uh, they, they listen. They looked rocky at certain times when we were in transition, but. We never really had very, very clear, obvious chances where we can look at and say, right, OK, that should have been definitely a goal. Um, you look at Diaz's chance, Salah's chance that they've missed, you know, Nunes's chance that he, he's missed as well. Um, they had much better chances, but hey, ho, we, we come away with one point. Would I have taken one point at this point? Yeah, yeah, but three would have been nice because we're trying to come fifth, so... Ricky, I mean, a lot of different talks about all of the performances across the pitch. We're going to get into each individual player. But one that kind of divided a lot of people today was Bruno Fernandes. A lot of people talking about how they thought his performance was poor. He had a fantastic goal. And me personally, I watched him at the end of the game and he was limping again. And did I think it was a good performance for him overall? No, I don't. But he does give absolutely everything every time he's on the pitch. And that's why... I, mm. I I love him, but what did you what did you think about it, the midfield performance and his performance altogether today? Um, there was some there was some really good bits. Obviously, the goal took the goal brilliantly. The first a first time shot, you know, to have the awareness to do that uh, instantly. And the, usually, you'd see a player try and lift that a bit higher as well. I mean, he took it. I think he took it with his laces with the inside of your foot. You can get it higher. Uh, now it's easier to get it higher, and sometimes you'd expect a floaty sort of shot that drops Mama into Lob. the net. Yeah. But he absolutely smashed it with his laces, and it was just out of the keeper's reach. But um, you know, a brilliant goal, well, well taken. And and I'll mention something at the end of the game as well in a moment. But overall, in his performance, still for me, just not a bit too much all over the place. I'd love us to have a bit more. Um, a bit more control of the game by having players in the positions and I just think he's a little bit of, he's erratic at times on the ball as I've said many times but he's also erratic out of possession so overall I would say um, I would say just about okay no, no more no more than that but I want to mention this I've often said when you bring somebody on in midfield because he does it a lot and he puts him on the wing um, don't put him on the wing put a winger on the wing uh, the, the, the disrespect, I believe it's disrespect, the ability that Ahmad Diallo seems to have, and the disrespect, I'm coming back to Bruno in a minute, the disrespect that the manager has got for him, for his ability to me, is an absolute disgrace. He doesn't seem to rate the kid whatsoever for him to do what he did. Then he got uh, suspended for one game. Then he doesn't get a minute on the field against Chelsea. He doesn't get a minute on the field today. And I think the kid's an absolute touch of class. So I would have... 
I would have put I would have given Diallo 15 minutes on the wing. Whether that means then you can't bring Mount on, but if you do bring Mount on, just take Bruno off. Don't put him on the wing. Now then, with hindsight, after he put him on the wing, he raced all the way back and dispossessed Salah around the edge of the box as Salah was about probably about to score. Do you know what I mean? So you can give the you, you could argue if he hadn't have uh, if he if he had have took him off, uh, taken him off, they they might have got they might have scored at that point. They might have got that winner. So so I can't see in I can't see into the future. But what despite the fact that that happened, if the same thing was to happen next week, I would play Diallo. But today it worked for him that he kept Bruno off. He had a really important hand in keeping us in the game. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I think the fact that Ahmad didn't get minutes is for mm. me, like you say, it's. I don't get it because what he did and how he got us through that FA Cup and just not even the goal, his, mm. his general performance, he deserves mm. more time. Mm. That's why it's, it's so frustrating for me to mm. not see him have minutes. But like you said, a lot of people were going in on Bruno and yeah, he got some passes wrong, he did. But it was so obvious to me that Part of Klopp's game plan, he spoke about how important Bruno is to our team before, is every moment he gets the ball, cut him off straight away. They were on him like there was no tomorrow. It was obvious from the Liverpool players. He had no time on the ball. You have spoke about him, how he's not very press resistant, and that didn't work for him today. But he did get the goal, and he was hugely important in the defensive work that we did in the second half. That is what I would say. And for me as well, definitely wasn't the worst midfielder on the pitch, because for me that was Casemiro. I mean... Jordan, what, what did you think of, of Casemiro? Uh, it's, it's quite sad, actually, um, to see a player that I've admired for so many years and now he's finally wearing our, our shirt to get to a point where you look and you think he's actually either A, checked out or Father Time has finally caught up with him. Because, you know, I've seen him over the years dominate games and look and go, do you know what, that's the equivalent of our Roy Keane at, at times. Uh, and he just doesn't, he just gets passed by uh, far too often. Um, I know we, we mentioned it, but when he kicked the ball out, when there was a player down, until the referee stops the game for me, as a leader on that pitch, he just keeps playing. And if younger players are wrong with encouraging him to put the ball out, that, that doesn't matter to me. We're Man United, this is our biggest rivals. You play to the death, you just keep going. So I, wouldn't, I, I, don't, I really don't agree that he's just casually kicked the ball out. And I think in time has gone by, he wouldn't have kicked the ball out. Um, and he just looks like a player that is kind of... Do you mean when it was like Madrid versus Barcelona? Yes. Yeah. yeah, but not even just that, that as, yeah, derby game, he definitely wouldn't have done it then. But just in general, you, I, I don't know why he's gone and done that. Uh, and I don't know where you were sat, but he got booed for doing that. Like, heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you just... Mainly, there's just so much pressure on his shoulders because he's not getting support from Casemiro next to him. Like he should be learning and developing, playing alongside Casemiro. That's what you'd expect. And just today, just far too often, I just don't see enough from him. I see a player that is that is that is kind of checked out. Um, I just want to touch on the on the Bruno thing. I, I think I don't think he had a great game. I think it was. I think he took the goal really well. Uh, defensively, yes, he, he's helped out. But you want him to make a difference in the final third, and. You look at people always compare his stats to, to KDB and, 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 and your sons and your people like that. The differences with those players is out of, out of five decisive passes, they can make three or four of them. And today there was opportunities for Bruno to make that killer pass. And far too often, he's hitting the first player in front of mm. him or kicking it out of touch or, or, or whatnot. Do you know why I think that is? Do you know why I think that is though? And I agree with you, it's, it's, it's frustrating. But I think, and this, I actually, Look at Ten Hag for this as well, I want to be honest. He is getting really frustrated. We know what his mood's like in the game. And he's trying to overcompensate. He's running actually too much, covering other people's positions. And he's trying to overcompensate because we're down in the game. So once he gets the ball, he's absolutely knackered and he's mentally fatigued as well. And you don't get the same payoff. And for me, I think Ten Hag needs to tell him, doesn't matter where we're at in the game, doesn't matter what the score is or what's happening, stick to your position and do your job. Don't be running all over the shop, doing everything. And that's, that's what I think his problem is. And I agree with you. Like, the amount of passes that we, he should have got right today was frustrating, but it's because he's overcompensating trying to do everything, in my opinion. How can, how can we expect a 29-year-old professional footballer to be, con to be told that you, you need to concentrate on the pitch and 
He needs to be more disciplined, and for me, Ted Hag needs old. to put his foot down on that. 28, if I'm not mistaken, 28, 29. I'd expect that, that sort of uh, conversation between the manager and a player like Kobe Minor, maybe, uh, you know, or Ganacho. But to, to think that about Bruno Fernandes, that's his personality, that's his style of football, that's how he plays, and he's always played like that. That's just a simple thing that it is. The, well, you'll get the one odd game every other month where he'll just keep things a bit simple, keep things tidy. Um, you know, not rush the pass and and just knock it knock it around the players that he's got next to him. But you know, today he's just again trying to trying to make those Hollywood passes, hoping it comes off. And it's not just um, him making the pass; it's also very frustrating for the players who have to chase the ball because you know you're looking at Bruno every other time. And I promise you, players are telling him like, "Calm down a bit," because I'm gassed out now. You you're hoofing the ball, and I'm having to run and, and get to the ball as well. So I'm I'm getting tired. It's just if if a manager has to tell a player that plays like that that you need to calm down at 29, 28 years old, I think I think that's worrying. Sometimes it's just keep it simple. A five-yard pass can be just as effective mm. as a 25-yard pass, mm. and sometimes you know there's an obvious option for him, mm. and he tries to go for that Hollywood I think, pass. I think you've just said something, by the way, that you seem to be missing uh, with what you're saying. Now the Hollywood pass and all that. Some of his five and six-yard passes go wrong. No, that's true. He's trying five and six-yard passes there again. Like, who said it was it? You said it. Get cut out by the nearest man. Mm. One when he tried to put it through to Mason Mount. Mm. Just a six-yard pass. It goes straight to the guy in front of him. Mm -hmm. There's two two exact same situations in the uh, was it the Chelsea game, the Brentford game, I think. Edge of the box, just kicks it at the player who's standing from here to that screen. You know yeah. what I mean? The well, thing is, sorry, Beth. The thing is, if the manager had that type of football that the team was playing, and everybody else in the team was making loads of five-yard, six-yard passes, and Bruno was the only person making those Hollywood passes, we would say, right, Bruno, you're the culprit. Look, I'm very much uh, critical of Bruno, but I will say is. We don't play football that accommodates five-yard passes anyways. The fact that we expect Bruno to do that, the manager doesn't expect the team to do that. The manager doesn't set up the team to play football like that. Look at Liverpool today. Um, how many times we heard you know, the commentators or whatever saying, this is sensational, the way they just one, two, three, four, and then boom, you have a final chance. We never play like that. The fact that we ask Bruno to do that, I think, is naive of us because we should be actually saying, Eric, why don't you ask the whole team to play the ball out five yards, for, you know, use everyone next to each other? Why, why are you allowing the hoof ball to take place and, and not getting hold of it? It's happened all season, isn't it? Well, yeah, we spoke about Bruno. I do want to continue on Casemiro for just a little bit because I do think a discussion needs to be had. I mean, talk about giving the ball away. He's terrible for it. Like, people always going on Bruno for it. I think he's worse. I think he's worse. And he does it in more dangerous positions. And not only that, not only does he give the ball away constantly, he's diving in because he doesn't have the legs to chase players. Mm. He's getting left for dead a lot of the time in the midfield, gaping holes. I actually thought that Nunes header, what he got, that then Luis Diaz finished the chance, he should have got there, he was slow off the mark. One of his worst performances in the United shirt today for me. And what scares me is that, when, that we've been told that a holding midfielder isn't our priority in the summer. For me, Mainu should be playing as like he can play as a six but I think he's so good as an eight and I like seeing him in the box because I mean look at his goal today. He can do he can do everything. We should be in for a holding midfielder because Casemiro should not be starting for us next season. He he can't. And it's a shame because he was one of my players of the season last year. Yeah, same he was quality yeah. last year. But it's like over the course of the year he's just deteriorated. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's sad to see like I said, it's um I don't, I don't know what your thoughts on it, but I just looked at him and he just looks like a player that has that's kind of just checked out. Like I said, and that, what epitomised it was him kicking our ball out. That is not the fiery leader, dominant midfielder Casemiro that I remember. Um, it's just like a player that was just sort of in cruise control. And then I think one of the Liverpool players walked past him, like sort of high-fived him and thanked him for kicking the ball out, and he, <laughs> and he sort of acknowledged him. Like that, that is not that is not the Man United Liverpool games that I've been brought up on. Like that don't happen. Mm -hmm. You know. So, I was, I was sat there saying, you know, can, can Amrabat do any worse than this? I know, he's, I know he's been poor, but can he do any worse? I mean, I remember when Bruno Fernandes played as a six last season. Would have preferred that, genuinely. Like, he was poor today, and holding midfielder is an absolute top priority. Mm. Absolute top priority. The, the problem is, is that, yeah, like I said, we, we, it's piling the pressure on Mano's shoulders. And, you know, he, he should, yes, he's an exceptional talent, but we shouldn't be so reliant on him in midfield. Like the the pressure should be should be shared, 
and we're going to end up putting him in a position where he's going to be doing too much and he may pick up an injury or something and that's not right and you're talking about the six the eight or whatever he's 18 so whatever weaknesses there are in his game he's young enough that he can develop and and and, and learn both positions but at the moment he's been asked to do a bit of everything so he's a bit of a jack of all trades in our midfield rather than just focusing on right you play in that six or you play in that eight so we're, we're not getting the best out of him we can still get more out of him we're so reliant on him yeah. i think i think there's a s s systematical problem as well because anybody that plays in that position that that si um, eight slash six at times they look really well when they go further up in the pitch so you look at scott mctominay right who's played the eight before him, him in the box, everybody's like, oh, Scott McTominay, for, for further up the pitch is really good. Kobe Mano, further up the pitch is really good. Ericsson, further up the pitch is very good. Sabitzer, further up the pitch is very good. What does that tell you? All of these players, when they're playing in this system that Eric sets out, they look good when they go further in the pitch. Now, you said we need a holding midfielder. One holding midfielder alone will not be able to cover the width of the pitch. It's too much of a task for him. The, he needs... Competent fullback, I think I think Dallas competent enough, but if Man United can get another fullback that's just as competent, if not better, will help the system more because the fullback is supposed to join in with the holding midfielder in attacking transition so that if we lose the ball, there's two men instead of one covering the width of the pitch because in between two men, you're cutting the pitch in half, aren't you? You're sharing the workload. Whereas any, any person you get in to be a single holding midfielder, they're going to get caught out. Yeah, I agree with that, but it doesn't take away from the fact he gives the ball away constantly and he's got no legs and he's not got the um, physicality, I feel like, to run anymore like it, the way that he needs to. But I do think that the system does expose his weaknesses even further and it is unsustainable for, ever, for anyone who plays there, I get that, but he's just particularly individually really poor at the minute for me. I mean, would you sell him in the summer, Ricky? Uh, yeah, I'd let him go. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer, though, um, in, in having your midfield players doing both jobs. If you speak to Roy Keane or Paul Scholes, I know it's a different era now, but they've won like, I don't know, God, God knows how many titles between them. It's about all of your defend, all of your midfield players defending when, you've, when you're out of position and all yeah. attacking when you have. So I've just looked at Liverpool's midfield today who, who play, played us off the park at times. I think you might regard it. He's not definitely a defensive midfield player, but maybe Endo. Is a midfield player. The other two midfield players, Slobber's Eye and, and McAllister, they're just midfield players. And and Endo went off as well and they brought on they brought on Jones and they brought on Elliot. Elliot they're yeah. not playing with a CDM. They're just central midfield They're just central midfield players yeah. and they played us off yeah. the park. But our best midfield players at keeping the ball. Ericsson's one of our best midfield players. Yeah. I'm not interested. Like people might say his legs are gone, but mm. Casimiro's legs are gone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Erickson came on against Liverpool in the Cup, still looks a class player to me, and he'll probably leave us in the summer, and he'll probably go and play for a better team than us, like Sancho's doing at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think what's, what, what's frightening about that Liverpool midfield is Klopp rebuilt that in one summer. Can I just say, Endo is a defensive midfielder, though. He, 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 he is more is. defensive than the two, but he gets forward to the edge of the box and he just keeps the ball ticking over. Yeah. They're but great they all, keeping it they, ticking, He yeah. does attack. I know, he's, I know he got disallowed, but he scored here, didn't he? You know, imagine Casimiro scores goals. But he scored a goal in open play, Endo, here in the, in the cup, didn't he? The one that got short off. Mm -hmm. in so, the does, box. So, in, so does Rodri, though. In, in he's, the a, box. he's a holding midfielder. Yeah, so, but, but this is it. So people are calling him holding midfield, midfielder players, Beth, but, but they're just good at tackling mm -hmm. and strong. Uh, or Rodri certainly. That's what a holding strong. midfielder yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, but it's the position that you play on the field. Yeah, it's not saying. about... It, 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 when you talk about a holding midfield player, it's not the characteristics. When, when Keno got described as a holding midfield player, Keno wasn't a holding midfield player. He's up and down, up and down, up and down, and he get in the box. It, what people were describing was his strengths, and his, his strength was his strength and his determination and his tackling. That's the strengths of his game. Paul Scholes was the strength. His strengths was scoring goals, making goals, getting in the box, not you know, passing, not tackling, not tackling. <laughs> but but they played as a pair. They're both up and down. So so when you talk about a CDM, 
When you speak about those two players, Roy Keane was described as a CDM, but he didn't play any deeper or any further forward than Scholes. Let me finish. And Scholes was described as an attacking midfield player, and he didn't really play any... I know he gets in the box more, but they get up and down the park together, then you've got a time you run into the box. So Liverpool are playing with three midfield players. And Endo, if you could get a heat map, I bet Endo's... I bet Hendo's average position on the field is hardly any deeper than any of the other two. Do you see where I'm coming yeah, from? Yeah. I get it's that, about yeah. where you're playing on the field and not about when it first came into into sort of a, the public eye, DCDMs and attacking midfield players. It was really attributed to what the players' strengths were, rather than the position that he took up on the field. They're not, you know, they're not players that necessarily stay back, they're just good at tackling and so they get called CDMs. Mm. No, but I, I, I never I never said otherwise. Like, I ooh, agree ooh, with you. I ooh. agree with everything you're saying. I never ooh. said we should have one player that just sits there and the other ooh. two go down. I'm just saying Casemiro categorically is our centre defensive midfielder. We ooh. need another one because his strengths, yeah, I agree. I don't, that's what I'm saying. We, don't, he's, he's, we, need, we need three good midfield players. I don't care if one of them's a CDM or not. Need, okay, <laughs> I, I, get, I get you that, ooh, that the ooh. three midfield players need to work in cohesion and ooh. they all need to be good ooh. defensively and going forward. I completely ooh. do ooh. understand that. But Casemiro is the one that's supposed to have the attributes then yeah. of a holding midfielder, the one that is supposed to break up the play, the one that is supposed to distribute the ball from the back. And he's mm. not he's not good enough at his mm. job. I'm sorry mm. he's not. He's late to tackles, he dives in too much, and we on need, the ball. We need he's not a fit, a better player. I just don't necessarily agree that I would describe that player as a CDM. But we need a fitter, better midfielder. player. But that's what Amrabat just was just a midfield to, player. That's what Amrabat was supposed to be. Yeah. So we all said last season, come on, you've got to get some legs around, around Casemiro. You, you know, you've got to get him some support. It's before Maidu made his debut. Get, you know, bring someone in to help him out. That was Amrabat. So they were supposed to be the, the pivot. Mm. And it, it mm. hasn't happened. I don't think... I, how many games have they started together? I, mm. Yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah. I mean, let's move on to... Uh, let's move on to Rasmus today. Rasmus Hoyland works his absolute socks off the guy. Bless him. Like he's he's I cannot cannot question his commitment, his determination, his work ethic because he just doesn't stop running. But it was a tough ask for him today. Van Dyke is top level. I mean he is. But doesn't get helped out by the lack of service. I mean, Faz, what are your opinions on, on that situation? Yeah, I mean we didn't we didn't go forward enough. Um and, and, and in a method where we were going to be looking for him, the way we were going forward is hit the ball to Rashford, hit the ball to Ganacho, and they cut in and try and have a shot on goal. Um, and maybe there's a deflection or a parry, parried away ball from the keeper and Rasmus gets in. We didn't, in, I don't think uh, I've seen once where we were trying to find Rasmus, in all honesty. No midfielders, no wingers, we were, we were trying to find him. And obviously there's, there's people going to turn around and say, he's not good enough or he's not the player that we need, we need a striker, you know, all of it might have some truth to it. But like I say, the team as, to, as, as a unit, we haven't played good enough to say that Rasmus wasn't getting the service or wasn't being brought into play. I just didn't see him being used at all for, for anything that we needed him to be used for. Did you see in the second half when Rashford's come down the wing and uh, ended up kicking out of touch and Rasmus absolutely lost his head with Rashford mm -hmm. screaming at him that he hadn't he made, does, he he hadn't made the pass. He dead ball line, Rashford, yeah. and at that point the ball was on his left foot if that was a left-footed player on that, I know, I know it's old out. Mm. If that was a left-footed player, if that was Anthony, he'd have fired it across. He fired it, yeah. And he's coming, he's coming running in at the near post and he's dying for that ball to be in front of him. Yeah. Whether he, he, he can just hit him and go in, but he's going to try his, yeah. his utmost to get on the end of that ball. Rashford almost faints as if he's going to hit it with his left foot, but checks back onto his right and loses it. Yeah. And Checks back onto his right and loses it. Don't check back. Just do it and just worry about what happens next. Some, I think sometimes they think they want to try and get the perfect goal where it's dead easy and someone's got to tap on. Sometimes when you get to that dead ball line, you've just got to fire it and hope for the best. And it, it, Hoyland will have been shouting him. He would have knew that he was there. Yeah. I'm sure he would have knew that he was there, but he doesn't fire it across. Hoyland's devastated. Yeah. It was just. It was nice to see that he is strong enough enough to have a go at someone like Rashford and be like, that's the pass you should have made. And I, there was a bit of off the ball then between the two of them, where afterwards the ball's gone down the other end and you could see Rasmus still saying to him, listen, like, Just get it across, get it across to me, I'm, I'm here, I'm making, I'm, I'm making yeah, the run. Yeah. Uh, but I think you're only going to get maybe one or two opportunities in the game. Yeah. He'll be absolutely distraught that that didn't get fired across. Mm. 
Yeah. And again, look at the goals he scored in the Champions League. Mm. I mean, th that alone tells you what he can do. He's got good finishing, you know, he's got good awareness, um, good first touch. We should be using those things. But the, like I say, the team, we're not playing the football good enough to say that we've given him the chances. We've not. When he came in originally um, in, in Manchester United, we already knew that, that it's a graveyard shift for any striker. So then he has a goal drought. He then goes on a crazy run. But now that the team are not playing, people are... They, it's very... I'm sorry, but it's very fickle and naive to just say he's not doing enough. He's, what is he supposed to really do? You want him to get the ball, beat two men and go and score like he's some, some mm. superstar, world-class Ronaldo type of player, but that's not the case. No, not one person can tell me, you know what, I've seen few games where Man United have played well and Rasmus has had a quiet game because defenders have kept him quiet. No, we haven't. So why are you going in on this young lad? Got to bring someone in to help him. Got to bring someone in, in, in to help him. I know we talk about... But you mentioned someone in as in a striker. Uh, yeah. I mentioned someone in as yeah. in a number 10. Bruno Fernandes is not the person helping him. Mm. He's not helping him. Mason Mann would have helped him a lot more because he's the type of player that likes to play... Listen, um, one, two, one, two passes, right, playing off someone is one of the most easiest, simplest and best methods of scoring goals and getting forward. Pass it to me, I'll pass it back and move. Pass and move. That's the, and these are the things Rasmus does so well. Look at some of the, our best moments, right, that we got from Weghorst. What does he do? Bring the ball, touch, move. Simple. Bring the ball, touch, move. It's not fancy, sexy stuff that you like, but it's the most effective. You're bringing wingers in. You've got speedy, strong strikers. That's what... Bruno Fernandes doesn't accommodate these type of things. I, I, I agree with you, Bruno needs to offer more, but we've literally got one striker. Yeah, um, so we, for we, sure. We, we need another striker in the ranks. For sure. And, you know, there's certain games for certain strikers, we just need another option. And I think at the moment, on a young man's shoulders, to lead the line solely for Man United, I think it's a lot of, a lot it's a of pressure. struggle for them. It is, isn't it? It, it? It's a proper struggle, and I agree with you on that. In terms of Rasmus, for me, work ethic is through the roof. I yeah. think he's got bags of potential. I honestly do think he will be a top striker. But I got absolutely ridiculed for saying that United should go for Ivan Tony in the summer, and I stand by it. Today, we needed someone who could challenge Van Dijk in the air, someone who could give it a little bit, someone a bit more experienced. That's what we needed. Rasmus, yeah, he doesn't have the service, and I feel so sorry for him. But he also isn't experienced as someone like an Ivan Tony who would give Van Dijk a bit more of an issue today and would ruffle some feathers a little bit more, in my personal mm. opinion. You need two top strikers at Man United. Yeah. You do. And I'm sorry, that's what Man United should be in the market for, in my opinion. Mm. Doesn't mean I don't think Rasmus is good enough, because I do. I yeah, really yeah. like the guy. Yeah. But to learn off someone like that who knows the league inside out as well, I think it'd be great for him, personally. Mm. Just offer something a little bit different. I mean... You know, you know the other thing as well, I'm really sorry, I'm just going to use two examples, one Chelsea, second Arsenal, and oh, number three is Man City. All three teams, they played a certain type of way where their fan base or neutrals can say, you know what, that team's missing a striker, they need a striker, but we can't say that. I know we need a striker because we're low on numbers, but we don't need a striker in terms of, oh, our team's playing well, we need a striker. Our team's not creating chances for the person who's going to play that position, whether that be Ivan Tony no, or not, whoever. That's not what I'm saying, though, and I get it. Like, I agree with you. We're not creating enough chances, and that's a team mm -hmm. issue. I agree with that. But what I'm saying today, to help out the team a little bit, the centre-forward's role isn't just to get on the end of chances. Obviously, sure. it's a big part oh, of the game. Sure. But a big part of it, to help us out a bit, would be hold the ball up a little bit more, be a bit stronger, yeah. run the chance, you know, make the right runs, like... Hoyland is very good, but he's inexperienced, and we could have done with that a little bit experience more. When I watched Ivan Tony for Brentford against us, when I watched him for England, like he's constantly he's a nightmare. He's, he's a nightmare yeah, for centre backs, and and and, yeah. and that's what we needed today, in yeah. my opinion. Gets... And I know it's not popular because Mark doesn't like him, but that's <laughs> yeah. my opinion. So. Mark doesn't like Ivan Tony. Like Tony. He doesn't think we should buy him, no. Because oh, yeah, it was because he will stifle. Hoyland's he won't progression help because him. can't believe that he, his, his, his thing is, is bringing a striker like him in he's going to want to play every single Hoyland, game Hoyland needs to take a break and, and we need a strike well I, Ivan Son is the perfect example and look I'm a big United fan and, and I want all the players to be great and I give everybody as much opportunity as he can and Hoyland's been here all season now it's his first season he's just about doing okay but that's it 
Yeah. Nothing more. I mean, Beth just, I thought about this, it was a little bit tongue in cheek, but I'll say it now, I've mentioned it. Beth just said we need two top strikers. We haven't got one mm. at the minute. <laughs> we haven't got one. Mm. He's half decent, that's we've all he is. We've got potential. And that's he, what he's got potential, yeah. he could get better. But at the minute, it's just an. It, look, it's. It's not the end of the world being an half decent Premier League striker, it's by the way. Right? I, w- I wish I was an half decent <laughs> Premier League striker when I was playing, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm not, you know, it's not a massive criticism. Yeah. He's an half decent Premier League striker. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. I think he has the ability to be a top striker. And, you know, you say about stunting Hoyland's development. It, first of all, I think it'll help his development because the last thing you want is a 21 year old being run into the ground and being stifled with injuries. With the type of player he is, he's explosive, he's pacey, mm. the, you're likely to get muscle injuries. Like mm. it's, it's, it's just science. Mm. So, yeah. one, hopefully, for playing three games a week, well, two games a week because we want to be in Europe, you need Hoyland some of the pressure to be taken off his back. Mm. He'll still get so much opportunity. Yeah. He can learn with another striker. He'll actually have someone else to train with in, mm. the, in, in, in the sessions because he'll have another striker there. And he can learn off somebody who has the attributes that he's, you know, wanting to wanting to polish. Yeah. It's a, um, the thing that people say it'll stunt his growth is very, very silly. It's very silly. I can't even imagine how people come to that conclusion. Let's say we get a striker in the prime years of their career, 28, 20, 28, 29 year old. A striker will play up to 32. That's about four years, right? If he comes in at 28, it's four years. By that time, let's say we move that striker on. Hoyland in four years will be 25 years old. He prime. still wouldn't have been yeah. hit in his prime. Mm-hmm. We could get two strikers back to back, play full full contract, and then Hoyland will be reaching his prime years. So I don't know what's this obsession about getting a young striker and letting him have all the minutes. Plus, don't forget, just because we get another striker in their prime years doesn't mean that person's going to play every single game. A properly clued manager would be rotating them, using them in different cup competitions. There's injuries involved, you know, the odd suspension or whatever, international duties involved. Mm. People don't think of all of these things. It will absolutely not stunt his goal. I, I, think, think, my, my, I, just, on, yeah. I just think my concern for Hoyland is that... He, He's been figured out by um, opposition teams that they can double up on him and physically manhandle him out mm. of the game. And he must get battered and bruised every 90 minutes that he plays. We've got to be able to bring some help in. And if at the moment the only other option is to play Russia through the middle, then effectively there's no other option. So I th- we have to bring someone else in. And I agree with you, if Ivan Tony's available, he's a proven Premier League striker at a good age. He's not over the hill. He will come in and hit the ground running. Um, so yeah, if, he, if he's available, I, I can't see why we wouldn't go in for him. Yeah, and, and and for me as well, just the last thing, the last thing I would say on it. You know, people worried about him coming in and stunting his growth. If you believe that Rasmus is the top striker that we all want him to be, he should be able to take the competition. Which you have to have competition. There's competition in, in, in top Premier League clubs all the time, and there's so much potential there. But you don't want to ruin it by putting so much pressure on his shoulders and running him into the ground that's what i'm saying and we need somebody else you like we we need somebody else it's it's so yeah. so obvious that we need someone else just for basic numbers because rashford down the middle doesn't work it doesn't i mean you talk about needing someone to ruffle the feathers a bit more today in terms of a, a, a striker physically i mean rashford would be he, he's not even anywhere near Holland's level so we need someone else mm. um, in, in my opinion to just help him out and we need someone who's who's top level in my opinion and, and there's there's not that many on the market for a decent price. He's got one year left in his contract, mm. Ivan Tony. He'll still mm. cost you, but you'll be able to get him. Yeah. Um, what I would love to see crosses in for Manchester United yeah. and a striker to just yeah. head of the ball. What I would give. I love I love like goals from headers and stuff and cr- good crosses from fullbacks and wingers. I mean that's what Man United used, was built on, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Wingers can that Charles can cross the ball from deep yeah. and yeah. Um, fullbacks that can cross the ball and midfielders that can spray the ball and. We just don't do it at all. Well, I want to talk about that. I'm just going to read a few super chats out and I'll come back to you. Dylan McNeil says, um, Beth gets all the comments. You are beautiful souls. What a game we watch. Good health to all. A happy rest of the year. Thank you very much, Dylan. Thank you for your super chat. LeBron James I think says, I look better than you today. <laughs> Why did nobody comment me? That's so mean. Yeah, because you get it every single day. Today I made an effort, did my hair, did my makeup, <laughs> and I didn't get one single compliment. Oh, Faz. I'm messing. Faz. I like the jacket. Thank you. It's really nice. LeBron James, playoffs are soon, support us Lakers. 
Uh, Calvin Stewart says, Wan Bam, Wan Ban, I think you mean Wan Basaka. Wan Basaka is a good player, but that tackle was stupid. Um, the point was a good one, though. Um, Tamrilik says, Mark gave Bruno a five. What's a four? He just takes. <laughs> what? He just takes the toilet in the centre circle. <laughs> what a disgraceful <laughs> display. Um, Super Chats never fail to disappoint. Martin Saunders, Ricky, everyone has players they like and dislike. Maybe Eric Ten Hag just doesn't like or rate Ahmad. International says, agree with Ricky on the Ahmad treatment. It's disgusting. Ashe says, do you think it's a coincidence that our best performers are our young players? Maybe it's because they actually listen to Eric Ten Hag. Pizza says, Eric Ten Hag is playing these players full season. Then there will be no excuse when he wants to sell them in the summer. They have been disgraceful. Clean out. Mm -hmm. Ghost Hunter says, people need to remember Casemiro is getting older and not younger. Luke Collins says, um, someone wake Ricky up. He's snoring down his <laughs> mic. <laughs> was that right? Was, was, that was right. No, Luke says that, oh, but, right, okay. but yeah. <laughs> Martin Erickson says, what's with the sudden bashing of Rasmus? Oh, my God. No one's bashing Rasmus. No one's bashing Rasmus. Rasmus, they're just saying we need two strikers. Heel Robinson says, we need seven new players, simple. Eric Ten Hag in until January. Pengers92 says, if Casemiro plays like, like that in the Saudi Arabia, he'll go missing. Brian says, do we not think something is off with Casemiro, i.e. injury or fitness? Not been given enough recovery time for players to follow the normal path back. Ali Visual says, Manu is, un is underperforming since Chelsea match. He loses the ball cheaply a few times and he's not engaged. Time to rest him. Mm -hmm. Not important says, as much as I love him, Hoyland does not does make sorry does make some horrific runs and needs more coaching. Look at the run he makes when Anthony's running 3v3. And we've got Tom Edwards saying, good result, but Rasmus needs more service. Um, Ali Fishwell says, Hoyland needs another season. He's running around, but he's always off position for the finishing end. We need a true poacher striker. Um, LeBron James says Fazzy is the best looking Liverpool supporter ever <laughs> Colin <laughs> Felix says get Vout back on loan next year to mentor <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it all Asthmatic Splash says we need to stick with the manager and get rid of the Deadwood we've needed this clear out for so long going to speak about Kobe Mainu in in a little bit because I think that's a harsh super chat on him I, thought, I think he's great but I want to speak about what you said crosses and full backs and getting involved and stuff like that I mean for me, I feel bad because Wamba Saka is not a left back. Like he's not. Like he's got his limitations going forward as a as a right back. Mm. And then to ask him to do it as a left back, it's a really tough ask. But you see in Liverpool just not even pressing him and, and leaving him open and still an Arno can while the Maguire don't want to pass to him. Mm. Because on the ball, he, he just is a bit of a liability. Going forward, sometimes his overlapping runs were hindering us rather than helping us. Mm. I mean, Faz, has not having a left back all season been like how big of an issue has that been for us? Massive, massive. Because you're thinking in terms of we're not, um, we don't have a left back to be helping Rashford, or we're not, we don't have a left back that can cross like Luke Shaw. But I look at it in a slightly different perspective, right? So look at it this way: Andrew Rana has the ball. He's got his two centre backs and a full back. He can only concentrate on that side of the pitch because he doesn't have a consistent left back uh, playing week in week out. He's already got one half of the pitch that he can't pass to because if he passes to the left centre back, the left centre back isn't confident enough to pass it to the left back because we don't have one. So he's only got one half of the pitch that he always plays through. And what that does is the opposition team, they will straight away have their triggers that if the ball ends up on this side, you know who to mark. And if the ball is looking like it's going to go here, this is how the opposition team are setting out. So they're already prepared. And that's not how it should be. It should be, you know, they don't know if we go left back, right back, both centre backs, they could hit us from anywhere. They could build up from anywhere. So you need to be aware and not having a left back. That's why, you know, like I say, I lost sleep and I thought it for days and days and, and said, came to the conclusion that left back is the first transaction that we need to make. We need to, whether you want to sell Luke Shaw or Malassia is a different conversation itself, but we need to get a left back ASAP because centre backs we're going to get already. And I'm glad that we're, we're in the window for a left back because that opens up our options to play out from the back and, and it'll help us going forward. It helps the wingers as well. I know Mark said before, right, that, that me and Ricky spoke about that Dallo didn't get back, uh, um, get back and get high enough, get up the field enough. And I'll let Ricky come on this because he said something about that, didn't you? you what said, about today's game? Yeah, you said that the team went going forward yeah, enough. We, 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 were, we, were, we were pinned back too, too much because Liverpool had more of the ball and they played better than we did in general. And uh, Dallo got for... 
It, it's such a natural thing to do on the on the football field when you when you are a full back. When you when you get forward, you want that midfield player to give it to you. And, and then also you want to try and interplay with the winger. It's just the way the game goes. And Dalot got forward. I'll be surprised if I go and re-watch it on the TV. I'll be very surprised if I can find one instance where I can say, Dalot should be further forward there. What's he doing? Mm. I think you, you can only go forward when the opportunity is there to Arrives. go forward. I know this is tongue-in-cheek, but when they're camped in our half, you can't just go running up the wing, can yeah, you? Yeah, Do yeah. you know what I mean? So, yeah. I thought Dalot had a good game. I thought the yeah, yeah, I thought it was great. Game. I thought it was great. Yeah, yeah. A fantastic the centre-backs were great. I thought Dalot was, yeah. was great. But you're right, we are massively missing uh, Luke Shaw. And you look at his availability this season, and yeah, a, a decision needs to be made in the summer about bringing someone in to put some serious pressure on him when he is fit or if he's not fit, somebody that can come in and can play in that position because you've seen when he's had competition in the past, he's been great. Mm. But he, he, you know, he just hasn't been fit. We've been so unlucky with injuries and I hate to sit there and blame the injuries because I feel we've been our own worst enemy as well. But it, you know, you'll know, you never have another season like this where the amount of injuries spread across the sure. season. Can I come in on you? Sure. Is there just a dead quick one? Yeah. Absolutely fantastic getting a draw with Liverpool with our sixth choice centre back playing with so many yeah. injured centre backs. Mm. Let's make no mistake, you mm, know, sure. his sixth choice that's staggering that. And we get a draw with Liverpool. And yeah, their first, first it's the most important, yeah. pe- probably the most important yeah. position on the pitch. Don't forget that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do I mean? think as well it is a penalty, by the way. Mm. I do think it's a penalty. I've had a lot of people, you know, message me saying it's not a penalty, whatever. But I said, look, the, the, the difference between the last game, the penalty against Allo, and this game is the intention is there to get the ball, and the player never actually connected with the ball. And the attacker did what the attacker had to do is lean forward, keep his foot in between the player's um, legs, and, and, and fall. And he gave the referee uh, a reason to blow the whistle. And VAR checked it so quick as well. At the end of the day, Elliot absolutely makes a meal of it and, 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 and sells it. That's but right. Wan Bissaka diving in like that, you always giving the referee. But a nine out of ten times, you'd think he'd get there. What I said earlier about the diving in. Yeah, like you can do, yeah. You know? He's getting so much stick for diving in, and I bet there's a, th- I bet I was going to say a million, and then I was going to say a thousand. I bet there's a hundred thousand United fans out there moaning who are the same one hundred thousand United fans who have congratulated him for making slide tackles in the pe- penalty area, probably 10, 15, maybe even twenty times in a season. Mm. This season, it's what he's good at. That's his game, so isn't when it? He, so when he when he gets one wrong, and I know it's an important one, and I know. It possibly costs, people think it automatically costs you two points. It doesn't. Mm. You don't know what would have happened if yeah. you wouldn't have got that pen. We might have lost if they didn't get that <laughs> pen because the, the ball goes to a different area and there's still about 15 minutes to go. So you don't know whether it cost us two points or not. Um, it feels like it did, but you don't know that. Um, it's not like it's impossible for them to still score later on, is it, if, mm. he, if he doesn't do that. So he, he makes that challenge. It's the type of challenge that he makes virtually every week and Regularly, you see people getting to the dead ball line or to the corner of the six yard box, and he slides in. And all these people are normally saying, Look at Wamba Saka, he's the best one on one defender in the world. Then he gets one wrong, and suddenly he's an idiot. It's a bit rich for me. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit about I mean, I want to congratulate Willy Kambwala for a really good performance that showed a lot mm. of promise. Mm. And it really wasn't an easy game to come into. He grew into the game, getting the crowd up for it composed. I, I liked it a lot. I saw a lot of potential there and the partnership with Maguire seemed to be a good one as well. Yeah. I don't know what different sort of partnership it's been this season, what number we're on now, but it's, it's another one to add to the books. I mean, it's the 26th different centre-back partnership for Manchester, <laughs> d- defensive partnership for Manchester United it's a this season. season. It's, like, a... it's, it's crazy. Yeah. But what did we think of Willy Kambwala and Harry Maguire together as a unit at the back, guys? Good. Fantastic Good. today, considering think, who yeah. we were playing against, and we got a two-all draw. Fantastic! I thought Kambwala did some great stuff. You know, he's, he's a lot of good blocks. In. Uh, I mean, I've not seen it again on screen, but he looks a bit unlucky to get books as well. I thought. I thought it was unlucky, yeah. but I was quite far away from it. So I, I like Willie a lot. He's, he's obviously so so calm on the on. You know, even in times when he's running back at goal, he's so good. Mm. He's so fast as well, oh, you know. So one brilliant he's moment rapid. where he, he chased back and dispossessed he's someone rapid, on the yeah. edge of the box. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. It helps us going into next season, looking at him and thinking, we do need centre-backs, but 
this this gives us a good good kind of headache knowing that we have a competent kind of centre back to play alongside anybody anybody we get. I'm still a bit um, not understanding if he's if he's good at carrying the ball, passing, breaking the lines, but he's obviously so young and he's not expected to be starting. But yeah, what, what a do you time like to again, be. Faz? What do you like again? What? what? <laughs> What, 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 like he, said what? You, he said you like something a lot. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> to watch it back. We, we missed that bit. Oh, watch I missed it. Anyway, I like right, right, a lot. Yeah, you, you like what I like. Oh, shit. <laughs> I apologise. I apologise. Pause. Sorry. <laughs> I just clocked what, what uh, yeah. That's his name. Okay, give me a rest. <laughs> That's his name. God damn it. I like to call players by first name anyway. <laughs> just <talking> about, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, uh, what a time it must be to be an academy player at the moment though. You're looking and you're seeing apart from Ahmad, uh, you're looking and seeing opportunities for these players to make their way into the first team and get games. It must be a, a great time to see players that were previously teammates playing against Liverpool and doing their thing. I said before the game, I also thought Harry Maguire was the right defender for him to be playing alongside mm. today, to coach him and talk to him through the game. And you could, you know, off the camera, you could see that happening. And I really could understand it straight away. I want to say, I want to give a shout out to a player today that I think has gone a bit under the radar, Harry Maguire. Honestly, I've I've said some words about Aaron Maguire on this show before, and deservedly so, I think, in a lot of previous seasons. But do I think you know he's he's, he's our future? Probably not. But do I think he's been absolutely top draw this season? And most importantly, today, you know, he had a job to do, and he was one of my players to watch actually because Kumbwala is a young kid coming in at centre back against a huge game against Liverpool at Old Trafford. And he had to lead that defence, and I thought he did it really well. I thought he gave Kambuala confidence next to him, yeah. and he was winning everything. He started off a little bit shaky, you know, got caught a couple of times, but he grew into that game, and, and I thought he was, I thought he was really good. I really do. Yeah, and again, you know, we we know what Harry's you know limitations are, mm. and you talk about over a full season, do you want him to be your starting centre back? No, but as part of a three or four group of centre-backs, 20, 30 games a season or whatever it is that if he comes in and plays, great. But I, I think the biggest thing for, for Maguire is the, the, the lack of pressure without the armband. Mm -hmm. I, and, and you see that that pressure has immediately dropped onto Bruno's shoulders. Like there's now even more of an expectation for uh, Bruno to deliver because we get the captain of Man United. That's, that's naturally what comes with, with the armband. You know, heavy is the crown, as they say. Like, but Maguire just seems to be able to come in now. He has got the pressure of the press conferences and all the stuff that comes with it, and he can just play his football. Yeah, I, I agree with agree with what you're saying. I do think what's interesting, though, is someone made a really great point on the super chat there. Gorowiski Gar says, Aaron Wamsaka Penn and Dallow Penn are both due to them tackling from the wrong side. They're both right bats and not left bats. They're not used to it. Yeah. I honestly do think... Whether they're both soft, let's be honest. But I honestly do think not having an out and out left back this season has cost us a lot. A lot. Not just because of them two instances, but going forward as well. Oh, an overlapping player for the winger, it has cost us a lot. Genuinely. But Would we be in a better position if we hadn't have let Reguilon go? Or Alvaro Fernandes? Reguilon weren't great either, to be honest. But he was going up and down. I know he wasn't great, but he was giving it's, it him all and he was crossing in. Reguilon going forward. Night and day to Wan Bazaka, mm -hmm. he gives you. But going backwards, he's so soft defensively. So it's it's just tough. Ricky, what's your thoughts? I I think that the manager had decided, and before you laugh, it happened two or three times that he was on the bench when Victor Lindelof played left back. I think the manager had decided, and obviously you didn't know how many more injuries you're going to get at that stage. You didn't know Victor Lindelof was going to get injured, but. Um, I think he decided that Victor Lindelof was better than him at left back. He was playing him ahead of him, yeah, well, which might playing, not have been a good decision. Playing him ahead of him, so you know, obviously we didn't know that it was going to be further injuries. But had, had nobody else got injured apart from Luke Shaw, and if all the centre backs were injured, I think we would still be seeing Victor Lindelof play. But that left might back not today. mean it's a good decision from no, the manager. No, I'm not suggesting just because that, it favours yeah, your yeah, player. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, 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 I'm not, yeah, I'm not suggesting uh, that, it, that, that, that for sure it was a, a good decision to let him go. Um, I think I agree with the manager, by the way, that Victor Lindelof's a better player than Reguilon. I do agree with him on that. But 
it was an awkward situation for him to be in to be playing a centre back at left back and having a left back on the bench who's only on loan. And I think that's well, why he let him go back. He, he also yeah. play, he played Amrabat there as well yeah. when when Regalon was uh, was was on the bench. So Ooh. he obviously didn't fancy Regalon after a couple of games. He made his mind up. Yeah, just some score updates. Two, Chelsea have just gone ahead 2-1. Um, What's the Spurs game? Spurs game is one all at half-time. Guys, honestly, Tottenham and Aston Villa, like I knew they would, it gave us so much opportunity to get back into this race and we've dropped scandalous points this week and we've done it to ourselves. When we don't get Champions League, which we won't, we have ourselves to blame because we could have got into that race and, and we didn't. So Ten Hag spoke about letting points drop in, at the end of games and it's been a consistent thing for us. Whether we deserved it with the Liverpool game or not, to be honest, the draws probably is a fair result. Mm. But at the end of the day, and Brentford probably should have beat us, but at the end of the day, Brentford, Chelsea and Liverpool all should have been wins that were seen out. I'm sorry, they should have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if we didn't play good football, they should have. And that's something we need to learn from. Quickly, Ganacho came off against Chelsea. We ended up conceding and losing the game. Ganacho came off again today, ended up conceding. But obviously, maybe just a coincidence. And... Of course, like we said, we need to rotate because we don't want to run plays into the ground. But do you think Ten Hag was a bit too hasty at Old Trafford to, to make that change today? Mm. I don't know. I, I think um, I don't think the fact we've conceded is because Garnacho's not on the pitch. No, mm. but I mean, like, should he have should he have maybe kept it the way it was for a little bit longer? We were we we did have opportunity mm. and we were, we mm. were going toe to toe with Liverpool at that point. Mm. We brought Amrabat on and we kind of said we're going to sit back and try and see it out here. But, but then he got criticised for not doing that at Chelsea. Uh, so. That's my point, is that mm. you look at the Chelsea game and I went mental that he didn't try and tighten things up. Um, so, no, he's damned if he do, he's, he's damned if he don't. I, I think he needed to bring someone on to try and get control of, of, of the game. And you look at the bench and Amrabat was probably the only option that he could have made. I, I, I don't think it's because Garnaccio wasn't on the pitch. He's not exactly unbelievably defensive, is he? So... I think that's a coincidence, personally. Yeah, well, it's just having that attacking threat. Like Ricky said, he would have brought Ahmad on a winger or, or, or maybe maybe kept the same style of player on. It, it, it's, it's interesting. And you also got to remember that team's confidence is shot a bit. True. So uh, at 2-1, yeah, if you're a confident and you're, you're flying high, you would have changed like for like and thought, right, we'll go and try and get the third. But I think where we're at at the moment, I think he's tried to tighten it up in the middle and that's why he, he's put someone on the more defensive came on, did, did he... Did he come on for Colby Mainu or who came on for Colby Mainu? Mount came on for Mainu. Right. Um, and my back came on for Ganacho. Yeah, the sure. only difference is, is today we're at home and Chelsea were away. But, I mean, it's one of them. It's one of them situations. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it was a penalty that we ended up conceding to anyway. And we never know what would have happened. So mm. it's it's an interesting topic. I do want to, I mean, some of the, by the way, some of the Willie Kambala jokes in the chat, by the way, are absolutely <laughs> sending me. I wish I could read them out, but... I can't because I'll get clipped off and I'm just not having it. AI is a big thing nowadays. <laughs> um, God knows what they'll make it into. <laughs> but Cobby Mainu with an absolutely unbelievable Worldy. strike today. And I mean, running out of words to describe him. Ricky, what thoughts? Fantastic. I love him. Absolutely fantastic player. And he's going to lose the ball. I've heard one or two people criticise him about losing the ball. But um, he's got that. He's got that ability to go past a man that that we we sort of miss from other players who you know even Bruno who's more of an attacking player he hasn't got that ability he did it a couple of times today as it happens on the edge of the box and I think we got free kick but in general he's a man that can just drop a shoulder go past someone and it opens up having use for you and you've got a little bit of space in which to you know in yeah. which to work and obviously it gives you a little bit of time uh, to select your pass. So, and that's not all. Obviously, the, the way he win, wins the ball back is fantastic. There was one, there's one tackle he made in the middle of our half where he he, he, he sort of jumped off the floor to to fly across. But by the time he got there, he was low, and it was wasn't a foul, and he won it back. Yeah. Just uh, he's, he's different class, the he, kid. He is great, and um, yeah, like you said, the way he can drop a shoulder, find a pass, he always seems to be available to take a pass as well. Um, I just. I just think we're so heavily reliant on him at the moment that it's it's fine for now, but we've got to bring someone in again to to help him out. Got to remember, doesn't have to be a CDM now. No, it just needs to be a good midfielder <laughs> that can be a good that can go both ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but this thing, this talk about mm. oh, he's an eight, he's a six, mm. specifically for him, he's eighteen, 
and this is where you want your manager to go. Okay, well, but that's a great that's a great point. Now Come, coming back to what I was talking about earlier about do, why do we need a CDM? It's a great point. He could play that role, yeah. and he could play as an attacking player as well. Yeah. So that's what you want. You want all the players to be able to yeah. do both jobs. Yeah. You know, defend and attack. He's, he's, Very simple. He's, he's, he's 18. The manager mm. should be looking at him and going, OK, his strengths are X, Y and Z, mm. but we need to work on these areas. Mm. And at 18, you develop him. By 21, he should be the complete midfielder. Mm. Um, but yeah, you've got to bring, bring some help in for him. Yeah, I mean, talking about the midfield quickly, and we'll do man of the match in a second. Actually, let's do our man of the match now, and then we'll talk about this question I've got to ask everyone. So who is, is everyone's man of the match? Faz. Willie. Willie didn't let you down. Willie don't let me down. Willie, Willie was Willie strong, beaming. calm. <laughs> Shall I go next? Yeah. <laughs> I'm absolutely speechless. <laughs> the way just... Joe Godalot thought he was absolutely awesome today. Absolutely awesome. Yeah, the way he took that ball, that I think when, oh, I, someone he passed it across and he turned and just He seems drove. to get a burst of pace as well. He goes, he, he, he leaves the defenders, well, he's a defender, he leaves the forwards for dead regular when he just gets it and bursts away from him. And then suddenly the pitch opens up. He, he was just absolutely Who fantastic. did he play, I think, in one of the cup games? Um, the forwards were saying that someone crossed the ball to Dallow from one side to the other and he, he controlled the ball mid-air, turned and left me. And I was like... There's no way I'm catching this guy today. He's just he's, he's that good. And I thought he was fantastic he today. He's he was, of, he was one of a kind of a player. He was he, he was great today. That lot um, for me. I think I'm going to agree with Faz. I think just given the 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 occasion, um, the, the lack of uh, of appearances, mm. and the fact he was playing Liverpool's so fair f- first mm-hmm. uh, attack, yeah. first choice attack. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with Willie. Interesting stuff. I'm going to go with Harry Maguire. I would only, um, the only reason I'm going with Harry Maguire, I, I, I like the fact that both of you have given it to Willie Kambala, so I wanted to give Harry Maguire a shout out because I did, I do think he, I do think he was top draw today, I really do. Um, both of them were really good. So, and you've gone with Dallow, who I thought was the other one that was in with the shout, so I'm going to go with Maguire. And we've all picked defenders. Yeah, exactly. It shows, shows what the game was like. There was only one weak link in the defence, and I feel bad because he's not a left back, but it's just, mm. defensively, he was, he was decent. He's just, on the ball, it's just nothing. Literally nothing, and mm. it's like, you need that, you need balance. And Liverpool just left him, yeah. and we still didn't pass to him. From the, from, from, and Anna still didn't look for him off the, off the uh, from the... Goal kicks and, mm. and distributing out from the back. But yeah, I uh, go with Harry Maguire. Go with Harry Maguire. This is the question I wanted to ask just to round up the show. So, Any comments from Eric? I can bring some in, yeah. But I wanted to ask this question first, yeah, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, go on. So, Manchester United have... It's to do with our midfield. Manchester United have Bournemouth away. That's going to be a tough game. We have um, Newcastle at home have, has been postponed. Then we have Coventry in the FA Cup finals. But looking towards the end of April, United have Sheffield United at home, they have Burnley at home. Obviously, there's no easy games in the Premier League, we know that. But considering how poor Casemiro has been, been, is there an argument that Mason Mount has to find a place in this midfield? Would you, at home, so Sheffield United and Burnley, consider playing Mount, Manu and Bruno as a midfield three? Mount, Manu and Eriksen I'd play. Let's get looking after that ball, all the players. Let's get them all looking after the ball. You know, give them give a chance. Say that again. Mount, Mount Mayne Mayne and Ericsson. Ericsson. Give Ericsson a chance. He come. I don't understand why he can come on against Liverpool and make a big difference for us in, in a cup tie and it's just completely forgotten about straight away. You're talking about the three being a three as a unit. Yeah. We're talking about mm. positionally, we're talking about discipline to hold your position, get backwards and forwards. Mm. Mm. I would honestly like to at least see it. Manu, Mount and Bruno in them games. I don't think you can do it in, in, in other games. But for me, Casemiro's giving it away so much anyway and, and missing out on challenges anyway, where I'm like, you know what, why don't we just give it give it give it a try? Mount needs to find a place in his team. He's doing too well to not. And he's not gonna bench Bruno and Manu mm. has to play. What do you think, guys? Faz, Jordan, chat. What does the chat think? Um I I, I like Mount, uh, Manu and Ericsson a lot, I, I do, but um, Manchester United can't live and breathe and function without Bruno Fernandes, that's, that's just a problem, so 
it'll have to be Mount Bruno and, and Mino. I think Mino and Mount will do a really good job together because they both have energy, you know, really good at defending, you know, really good at going forward, good at passing the ball around. So, but, but we know he's probably not going to do that. He's probably just going to be playing Casemiro again in, in those games as well. Which is which is him sticking sticking by his stubbornness and and his experiments that he does. So, yeah. By the time it comes round, like that, is, is that in the space of four days? Did you say that? Burnley? is that we're playing them both in one after the other? Burnley yeah. and Sheffield United. Yeah, twenty fourth and the twenty seventh. By the time that comes round, Champions League might. I mean, it's fairly a dead duck now. It might be completely out of the, out of the window. Why don't he rest a few players? Why doesn't he play Ahmad on the wing and drop Rashford completely for two games? I saw your tweet he by won't the do way. It, I saw your tweet by the way during the Chelsea game, Beth. Where it's about time to bring Rashford on. It's never time to bring Rashford on. The only reason. <laughs> it's never time God, to bring. He's, just he's get bringing. Rid of he's him. bringing <laughs> tweet receipts. The reason why I thought it, and I was wrong, by the way. In hindsight, I was wrong. The reason why I thought it is because it was so open and yeah. it was like a basket. Basketball game and Rashford mm. in behind usually is a, is a big threat. Mm. So I thought that's why I think. To, that's why I think he has been. <laughs> did, did, but, did, did you get hammered for that tweet? Or was, no, or was, because I think a lot of people did think it, mm. and me and my brother both said it. We would have brought him on, and then after the game we were like, I'd never that, bring him on. We were saying we've, it was the wrong decision, and that's there. and that's told that's got shown us now. It's the wrong thing. On, let's see what he can do. Look at the goal. You talk about pacing behind. Look at Ahmad's goal against Liverpool. It's like Linford yeah. Christie. <laughs> By the way, uh, um, Elanga got one the other day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and Wood, well. Wood again. What scores that game? Was that uh, one? Uh, one, 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 but you know, again. Mm. Chris Wood, Sorry, Beth. What a Go on. I was on about Ahmad when you watched us talk about midfield players. Well, I've, you just drilling me back from the Chelsea Can't. game, yeah, bringing yeah. up receipts from the Chelsea game. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, that's. Mm. I mean, yeah, that's that's where we're at now. One thing on you wanted to know what Eric and Hag had to say. I'll quickly read out because at the end of the show, but Ten Hag says, on one side, I'm disappointed that we have dropped seven points in one week after being in winning positions. True. Why are you disappointed? You said you played good games. <laughs> but we have to blame ourselves for making stupid mistakes. Mm. On the other side, I am very proud. You see how we are improving and the potential of this squad is amazing. I am proud. In decisive areas, we are losing battles, especially with young players. We were not confident to win them, um, the duels, but... but we encouraged in the second half to do better, and they stepped up. That's basically like the, the, the majority Short of what sweet, he said. Yeah. Short and sweet of what he said. But that's where we're at now. Got some super chats in as well to finish the show off. LeBron James says, Fazzy, you agree that Willie was Fazzy. massive today? The, no, I'm not reading the rest of that out. <laughs> Alex J. Murphy says, everyone appears satisfied. <laughs> What's he said? Do you read it yourself? Um, Alex J. Murphy says, everyone seems satisfied by Willie Kambuala's performance today. Um, Ali Fishwell says, what Mount and Manu is lacking is height. Lee Cape Tyne says, Bruno has to be dropped from Mount. Gary Blart says, we need to have a tough conversation about Hoyland. Jim's 91 says, you should have to sub Bruno for a real winger. Pengers 92 says, we are desperately looking for a wide player that can cross the ball, all while Langer is cooking Spurs with them as we speak. I mean... Elise, I watched for Crystal Palace the other day, who we are linked to, and he came on and looked very good. LeBron James says he glazes Dallow and then says Anana is nice a couple of months ago, and now he likes Willie. Caught Faz in 4K. Faz, we support you. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, you said you liked Anana's booty. Um, Barney says, just joined. Has anyone unfairly slated Rashford yet? We actually didn't speak about Rashford. Ricky did, though, so have a go at him. Um, crazy says, we never unfairly slated him. Ooh, cold with it, Ricky. <laughs> cold with it. Um, but yeah, that is everyone for the show today. And that's all the super chats that we had in that I could see. So thank you, everyone. I mean, you guys need to go and read through the chat later because it was hilarious. One thing I would say is, are we happy with a point at this point? We are. It's got to be. <laughs> yeah. We are, aren't we? Yeah. I can't remember where we were going into Oh, the can game. I just say one more thing about that, by the way? Yeah. I'd love to know how long it is since we played Liverpool, because we play them twice every year. When did we last play them more than twice in a season and not lose to them? But it's some time ago. I'd like to know the answer See, to that. See, that's a good stat for Eric Ten Hag, mm. Faz. You love to bring up the bad stats. He's Eric got the Hag, best home record as well, hasn't he? Eric at the Ten moment, Hag, since Alex Ferguson. this season, Klopp versus Eric Ten Hag mm. is, how many goals is it today? Two on each side. Six five. Six five. Six five. Oh, Trafford. It... Yeah, six no, five Anfield overall. It was oh. I'm saying yeah, overall. Six five overall six and five at Old Trafford. This season, and we've not we've not lost to Liverpool at Old Trafford while Ten Hag has been manager. 
obviously there's one anomaly in there from last season that we don't want to talk about. Mm. But that is pretty decent. It's just the, this team, this team, you never know what you're getting. But look, Ricky, thank you for coming thank on. Thank you. Put, keep me on my toes as usual. Um, <laughs> Jordan, we've missed you and it's a pleasure to have you back. Yeah, I love it. I'll be back up soon. Yeah, you better be. You were a good luck charm today. I've got a few more fixtures before the end of the season, so I'll be up. Yeah, good stuff. Doing and Wembley as well. So Doing Wembley? Wembley. Oh. Semi final. Yeah. Oh, I'll that'll be, be me. I'll be there. Yeah. That'll be me, you, and whoever's here. Good. I'll see you there. Wait, you go into Wembley, you coming in? Yeah. No, I'm going to Wembley. Oh, yeah, right. Going so to Wembley. Yeah, you're going to Wembley. Well, yeah. Is there anyone here with me? Yeah. Or? Kev? Mods, yeah. Greg. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. Yeah, Kev. But, but yeah, I'd rather have Kev than you, anyways. <laughs> oh yeah. Just. I'm have... joking. I'm messing. I'm messing. I'm messing. Yeah, we'll have a talk about. That I'm off messing. I'm messing. Um, and Faz, thank you as always. Thank you very much. Thank By you. the way, we wanna. Uh, if we all together, I would like that happy birthday right, to listen. you. What, what, what were we you're, supposed you're, to do? Trying no, to secure the one. new contract. I was I was <laughs> I'm trying to do a Rashford <laughs> for ready for next season. <laughs> but no, happy birthday to Mark. We were supposed to sing together for Mark. I'm not singing. But I know, yeah, I've right. wished Mark happy birthday already. You, you were the one who forgot it. <laughs> but anyway, we've got to wrap up. We've yeah. got to wrap up. Jordan's got a train to catch. Look, everyone, thank you so much for all of your comments, all of your super chats. Please hit a like on the video. It really does help us out. And thank you for staying with us. It was a nice forum today. It's nice and chill. So thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll see you on the next one.